you, I hope my slides are visible. Yes, visible. Okay, thank you. So first of all, first of all, let me thank uh, Dr. Fatima and other organizers, organizers who are uh, arranging these updates. The topic that has been given to me is on dilated cardiomyopathy in children. And uh, we are going to talk about some recent updates uh, related to this particular disease. So uh, as we all know, there are three kinds of cardiomyopathies when we say cardiomyopathies. One is, of course, the most common one is dilated cardiomyopathy. But we also have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and restricted cardiomyopathy. The major difference is that in dilated cardiomyopathy, we have dilated dysfunctional left ventricle, which has poor contractility. And that is how the hemodynamics are affected by that particular fact. So we're going to talk about DCM or dilated cardiomyopathy today. So let me just introduce this subject. It is characterized by left ventricular dilatation and systolic dysfunction. It can occur at any age, although perhaps it is more common in the first year of life. In most of the cases, it is just an sporadic occurrence, but less than 5% of cases can give you a history of cardiomyopathy in their siblings. It is a progressive disease and often leads to heart failure. And that is the time when it comes to attention because the patient becomes symptomatic. In fact, it is the leading indication for cardiac transplantation in young adults and in children. When we look at the microscopic structure of myocardium in dilated cardiomyopathy, you will notice that there is a lot of fibrosis that has replaced the cardiomyocytes. So DCM is actually characterized by changes at the molecular, cellular, and interstitial levels. There is apoptosis, which means death of cardiomyocytes, and cardiomyocytes are replaced by fibrosis as is being shown over here. LV myocardium thereby becomes very thin and the ventricle tends to dilate. LV becomes more round also. Not only it dilates, but it also becomes more round and has obviously reduced contractility. Now, when we look at the causes of DCM, we can classify it into primary and secondary. Primary list is being given here. And in secondary, we have infections, we have metabolic disorders, we even have some neurological disorders like muscular dystrophies, et cetera. But despite significant diagnostic progress that has happened over the last decade, in fact, majority of cases of childhood DCM, we can't figure out the etiology and it remains unknown. Some cases may have been secondary to myocarditis, but again, if they don't present at the stage of myocarditis, we only see them as dilated left ventricle and we label them as dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, how common is DCM? In fact, it is one of the, it is the most common type of childhood cardiomyopathy. The overall incidence has varied from 0.34 to 0.73 per thousand children. Highest annual incidence is observed during first year of life, as I said, and overall incidence is lower in children compared to adults. As I said, familial cases may occasionally be seen and they usually follow an autosomal dominant inheritance, but sometimes they could be recessive inheritance or even X-linked inheritance. Clinical presentation is often in the form of heart failure. And when the infants present with features of heart failure, they often go to pediatricians and sometimes the pediatricians may misdiagnose it as bronchiolitis. However, most of the presentation would be in the form of features of CHF, like feeding difficulties, excessive diaphoresis, tachypnea, but some of the patients may come with very aggressive disease and may present with shock in cardiovascular collapse, and rarely sudden death has been reported because of cardiac arrhythmias. So much so that about 40% or 50% of cases may require admission to the ICU and may require ionotropic support at the time of presentation. A history of viral illness is not always present. And in fact, it could be misleading because we may diagnose them as having bronchiolitis. If you look at the data from the two registries, big registry that we have published from uh, USA and Australia, then you would see that majority of patients would be having heart failure at the time of presentation, but few could be diagnosed because of 
lesser severe symptoms, but 5% may present with sudden cardiac death in the series that are reported from the two countries. So how do we investigate? These are the basic investigation that we have to do in every case. And I think we all are very aware of most of these investigations. I just want to highlight that biomarkers or BNP is something that is now getting more and more attention in heart failure in infants and children, and therefore it is becoming part of the routine investigation. But many of these patients, if you are really looking for etiology, you may have to go on for much more advanced investigations like cardiac MRI, halter monitoring if you're suspecting arrhythmias. Endomyocardial biopsy used to be quite commonly performed earlier. However, considering that it's an invasive procedure, we often are not very enthusiastic about doing biopsy in children. And now with the coming in of MRI, where you can, to some extent, make a diagnosis of inflammation, myocarditis, in infiltration, the indication for biopsies are actually reducing. X-ray chest could show varying degree of cardiomegaly depending upon the duration of illness. Those who have long illness can give you a much bigger heart than those who have relatively short illness. Although shorter illness may also point towards myocarditis as the underlying uh, etiology. ECG is again nonspecific and generally would show you some tachycardia, STT changes, you may even get features of left ventricular hypertrophy. That's not uncommon because the LV myocardial mass overall may be high because of dilatation. So you may get LVH and some STT changes as shown here. However, ECG needs to be seen in great detail because you may get a clue as to why the left ventricle is dysfunctional to some extent from some cases. And this is important to diagnose because these conditions can actually be treated and the heart function or the LV ejection fraction returns to normal. So these are two examples of a long QT, as you would see here. This is a little bigger child. This is a two month old infant. Both of them are showing a long QT syndrome. And I wouldn't say syndrome, it's long QT, which is actually secondary to hypocalcemia and vitamin D deficiency. Now here, if we make this diagnosis, then we could perhaps reverse this cardiomyopathy or reverse this myocardial dysfunction by simply supplementing with vitamins and calcium. This is something we see very often in our country, and I'm sure you would also be seeing it commonly there because of many, very often our mothers are deficient in vitamin D and therefore their calcium levels are low and the infant is also born with hypocalcemia. This ECG shows you abnormal Q waves in one AVL, and you also have Q waves in V5 and V6. So this is again suggestive of anomalous left coronary artery from pulmonary artery, which can give a pattern of infarction in the ECG. And again, patients are going to present with left ventricular dysfunction, dilatation, heart failure. But if we can make this diagnosis, then we know that one can be treated surgically and the left ventricle is likely to re revert back to normal. This is an example of a so-called tachycardiomyopathy, where you will see that the P waves are quite abnormally located. So this was a case of persistent reciprocating junctional tachycardia, or PJRT as we call it, which is an ongoing tachycardia. The heart rates are not too fast, more like 120, 140, and the patients continue to have tachycardia, and therefore their left ventricle over a period of time dilates. And again, they would present to us with a cardiomyopathy-like picture. And often we think that this is really sinus tachycardia. And we kind of ignore it. And we usually take it as a part of cardiomyopathy, tachycardia being part and parcel of heart failure. However, if you look at the ECG carefully, the P waves are abnormal. Also, these patients can have very fixed heart rate. So even during sleep, their heart rate may be fixed at 120. Even when they're crying, their heart rate does not go beyond 130. So that is a clue to say that it could be the tachycardia which is producing cardiomyopathy and not really typical DCM as we see it. So ECG, in my opinion, is very, very important and must be looked at very carefully. I'm emphasizing this again and again because often we get patients who have four or five echo reports with them, but not one ECG. And then obviously, when you look at the ECG, then you know that this is not DCM. This is another 
disease which is producing dcm like picture let me see why my slide is not progressing okay now coming to echocardiography which we all know is the most important investigation not only for diagnosis but also for serially monitoring these patients what we do is we measure left ventricular dimensions or left ventricular volumes and we try and derive fractional shortening and ejection fraction and that is what is done to know how bad or how good the left ventricle is i think here the important point is that when we are taking dimensions we must we must adjust it for the body size because in children the left ventricular dimensions could be very different than both than what they are present in adults so we have these nomograms available on website actually and if you put the end diastolic dimension or end systolic dimension then you can get z scores anything more than plus 2 z score would be considered as abnormal another thing that we need to look for specifically is the mural thrombus in the left ventricle cavity because if it is present then that also requires an urgent kind of treatment coronaries again i would like to emphasize that we must in all left ventricular dysfunctions look at both the coronaries origin to see whether we are dealing with an anomalous origin of left coronary artery from pulmonary artery and this should be part of the routine echocardiography so on echocardiography we look at the various Uh, chambers we make m mode dimensions to try and and diagnose uh, or try and calculate fractional shortening you can use simpson's method for ejection fraction also and it is not really unusual to get some amount of regional wall motion abnormalities on echocardiography however as i said you must rule out anomalous left coronary artery from pulmonary artery in all patients presenting with dilated cardiomyopathy and you will have a clue on the ecg also mri is not routinely done as i said it is a special investigation you may have to done do in some cases but if you do then sometimes the thrombus is very well seen especially the apical thrombus which you may miss on echocardiography because it is lying right at the apex so mri that way is very useful it also gives you ejection fraction but what we generally use mri for is to diagnose myocarditis so if you are suspecting myocarditis then having the late gadolinium enhancement would put in a diagnosis would give us a clue that we may be dealing with myocarditis although patient presents with a picture of dilated cardiomyopathy i did mention about biomarkers which are becoming a routine now in all patients of heart failure especially dcm and now we have some data in children also where it has been shown to be of great use the first use is that it differentiates heart failure from the pulmonary causes of respiratory distress especially if the patient is presenting in acute settings also the level of elevation may actually give you some idea about the prognosis it is generally believed that elevated natri am i audible yes ma'am Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right, all right. I just wasn't sure, so I said, "Okay, thank you." So, elevated natriuretic peptide could be associated with worse outcome. So, when we are discharging somebody uh, from the hospital, if we look at the BNP and if we realize that BNP is still very high, we may be looking at a patient who is probably going to come back to the hospital. So, there is a high likelihood of admission into the hospital, and also. high chances of need for mechanical circulatory support in fact there are there is data to say that a very high level may indicate that even if patient looks relatively stable this patient is probably going to be needing a heart transplantation so we do it serially to monitor the progress of the patient in fact this is study published recently of 137 children it was found to be the strongest independent predictor of adverse outcome so they did multivariate analysis and of course there were many factors which were associated with adverse outcome but anti pro bnp level was the strongest predictor in the multivariate analysis for adverse outcome so we must exclude these causes before labeling somebody dcm and i like to call it as curable dcm although it's a misnomer because dcm is not supposed to be curable however any patient presenting with left ventricular dysfunction dilatation 
low ejection fraction, please use this checklist and exclude these causes, coronary anomalies, non-specific arthritis, which we see in young ladies or young children, especially females. And again, this is something that is quite common, I wouldn't say quite common, but is often seen in, in country like India. And I'm sure you also see these patients. They may be going to pediatricians or they may be going to the uh, adult cardiologist. Tachycardiomyopathy, I showed you an example of PJRT. Hypocalcemia, vitamin D3 deficiency producing long QT interval. Beriberi is another cause that is thankfully almost gone, but is still seen in some pockets of India at least. Venogallin malformation, which is seen in neonates mostly. Obstructive lesion is just to complete the list. I'm sure it is easy to diagnose coarctation and critical aortic stenosis in patients presenting with heart failure. Rarely, there could be deficiencies like carnitine deficiency or even hypothyroidism. The list is important because if one can diagnose these cases, then the treatment is very, very rewarding. And then the child is actually cured of LV dysfunction. And that's why I've labeled it them as curable DCM. Now let's talk of the management of these children. First, medical management. As we all know, there is not as yet a treatment that offers a complete cure. The treatment would be mostly symptomatic where we give drugs to relieve the symptoms and we try and maximize the cardiac function. So our goals of therapy are improving symptoms, preventing progression of ventricular dysfunction, control of factors that often aggravate the symptoms and heart failure, for example, anemia and infections. We also should try and improve survival if there are drugs to do that. And in case of infants and young children, we have to make sure that they get enough nutrition so that their somatic growth and development does not suffer. So when we talk of pharmacologic treatment, there are five targets where we like to use drugs to manipulate these targets. We like to reduce preload. We like to reduce afterload. We want to increase contractility. Since there is chronic sympathetic activation, we may want to blunt that response. And of course, finally, we would want this globular left ventricle to go back to its original shape or remodeling. So diuretics, I think we all are very familiar that they would be producing rapid symptomatic relief and must be used in patient in heart failure. We most often use furosemide. Spironolactone has been shown to reduce mortality in adults with DCM, but such data is not available in children. The second most often drug that we use, in fact, I would say ACE inhibitors should come ahead of diuretics, is ARBs or ACE inhibitors. We have much less data with ARBs, but we have now some data on ACE inhibitors, especially on captopril and anaropril. Again, these drugs have been shown to reduce morbidity and mortality, at least in adult studies. But we should be using the maximally, maximally tolerated doses of ACE inhibitor to get the best output or best effect. We have to keep these side effects in mind, as we know. Fortunately, children usually do not get dry cough or very infrequently get dry cough, and therefore that's not much of a botheration in small children at least. This new drug that's being used left and right in adults is something which I will show you the data, but I think there is a good potential to use the combination of Secubitril and Valsarta. Beta blockers is something that we must use unless patient is in stage four or stage D heart failure because beta block blockers downregulate the high sympathetic overdrive that all these patients have. So it will help in reducing or in improving the heart rate. It has also been shown to improve symptoms as well as left ventricular ejection fraction. And there is data to say that it improves survival in adults, but there is some data on that front to improve survival in children also. And I will show you that data. Most often used drug is carbidilol. Digoxin is kind of very occasionally used these days. Most often we are not using this so-called positive inotropic drug. Yes, we use inotropes intravenously in children who are in end-stage heart failure. The other drugs that may, you, that may have to be used are antiarrhythmics, especially if you find some arrhythmia associated with DCM. Aspirin, a lot of people use if the LV dysfunction is quite bad. However, anticoagulants are mostly used if there is an LV clot. And most of us do not use anticoagulants otherwise. 
Evabridine is another new drug that's coming up, or I wouldn't say new, but it's a new indication of evabridine. And there is again some data on evabridine. When it comes to drug treatment, there are very few randomized controlled trials for pediatric DCM. In fact, one on ACE inhibitors, one on carvedilol, one on inalapril, which is showing more of a safety profile. And then now we have evabridine. And let me just show you a couple of these uh, trials. Carvedilol, which is a beta blocker, is one such trial published in 2007. However, the kind of patient they included were not just DCM, but also some end stage congenital heart disease patients who had ventricular dysfunction. Out of 161 patients, they had made them into three groups. One was placebo, low dose, and high dose. And as you would see, there was actually no statistical significant difference between the groups based on the dose. However, in a subgroup analysis, it was shown that patients who had systemic left ventricle, which was like dilated cardiomyopathy, they did have some trend towards benefit. So this is the only study which has shown that carvedilol may improve survival in children. However, as I said, the data was a subgroup analysis of these patients. We also published our data uh, about nine years ago, where we had patients of dilated cardiomyopathy given carvedilol. And as you would see in the graph, their symptomatic status definitely improved. At the end of the follow-up, you can see that majority of patients were ROS class one. We also saw if there was a difference between those patients who were given IVIG versus those who were not given IVIG, but the improvement are in both these classes. So the conclusion was that oral carbidolol added to conventional therapy improves ventricular function and clinical symptoms. The drug is well tolerated. However, close monitoring is required because it may worsen heart failure and it may also produce bronchospasm. So I think there is enough data to say that beta blockers should be used in dilated cardiomyopathy as long as it is tolerated. Evabridine is this data that again came in 2017. And as you would see that out of 116 patients, primary endpoint, which was basically reduction of heart rate, was achieved in 70% versus 12% on placebo. And this was statistically significant. However, again, BNP, decrease and adverse events were the same on evabridine compared to placebo. If we look at patients who had improvement in terms of ROS class, again, there is better improvement with evabridine. However, it did not reach statistical significance. Same is for ejection fraction. Ejection fraction improved little more with evabridine compared to placebo. So we have started using evabridine over and above beta blockers. If we find that beta blockers are not reducing heart rate enough or beta blockers are not being tolerated very well. So in those instances, in those patients, we are adding evabridine or sometimes we are using evabridine instead of beta blockers if patient is becoming intolerant of beta blockers. This is a study I was talking of, which is panorama heart failure study of secubitril and valsartan combination, which I think adult cardiologists now have started using very often. Now, this trial is actually a 52-week trial. However, we don't have the results completely as of now. But based on its short-term result, this drug has been approved by the FDA for the treatment of children aged one year and older who have symptomatic heart failure and systemic left ventricular systolic dysfunction. The approval was actually based on a 12-week analysis which showed that the combination of these two drugs would reduce anti-pro-BNP in children who are suffering from dilated cardiomyopathy. As I said, it is an ongoing study and we still don't have the 52-week follow-up data for the full study population. So we don't have the survival analysis yet, but at least based on the anti-pro-BNP levels, this drug has been approved and we have also started using this drug. In fact, subsequently, one more study came of 36 children where DCM was present in 24, where again, its safety was proven. It was also well tolerated. Study cohort included usually high-risk failure patients of which one third clinically improved after starting subupitril valsartan combination. So I think more and more data is coming on this drug in children. 
but as of now anybody above the age of 1 year i suppose we could try giving this drug and see the response it probably may score a little bit more over enalapril but i'm not sure because we don't have that data we only have anti pro bnp level uh, improvement with this drug compared to enalapril but when we talk of dcm there are lots of non pharmacologic treatment also available especially patients who continue to deteriorate despite pharmacologic therapy so these are some of the established therapies for dcm cardiac transplantation ecmo for short term benefit and now we have ventricular assist devices which are available for children also where you could use them as a bridge to transplant till you have a donor available and iabp which is generally used in much bigger children or adults rather than in small children we also have some other you know uh, modes of treatment which we have probably followed from the adult studies for example crt perhaps useful in patients who come with left bundle branch block pattern implantable defibrillators for those who are showing episodes of ventricular arrhythmias or even sudden aortic cardiac death stem therapy cell therapy came in quite with a bang however the results have not been very consistent and i don't think many people are using this therapy anymore but what i want to talk to you about is the pulmonary artery bending so let's talk of transplantation first as we know this is the only definitive treatment for children progressing to end stage heart failure in fact it is dcm is the most common indication for transplantation in children and adolescents however there are limiting factors the first one being availability of a suitable donor because you have to match the donor complications of rejection and lifelong immunosuppression survival at one year is quite good 95% three year is 87% however if you look at the overall survival at 25 years it's not so good it's 37% so all in all cardiac transplantation appears to be very good but it is not so appealing option for parents for infants or parents with small children or infants whose life expectancy is likely to be drastically limited when you compare it to their healthy peers what are the predictors of survival this is the data that was published in 20, 2012 and as you would see that overall survival is about 50% but at about 10 years it's about 70% 72% at 20 years it becomes 50% older age at transplantation more than 10 years was associated with worse survival white versus non white again worse survival in non whites and a history of previous myocarditis was also associated with much less survival so considering that cardiac transplantation is associated with so many issues especially when it is being done in young children there has been a recent shift in focus at reactivating cardiomyocytes myocytes proliferation and restoring the lost myocardial tissue so called regenerative medicine and it can be achieved by two ways one is administration of stem cell or progenitor cells into the heart and as i said it started off quite well there were some promising results in reports some of the reports however the reports the results have not been consistent what is now being done more and more is reversible pulmonary artery bending this has been kind of reinvented for children who have dilated cardiomyopathy lv dysfunction but have preserved rv function and this is the data that was first shown from uh, by dr daitmar where he showed that once the right ventricle once the pulmonary artery bending was done the left ventricle which was so huge and poorly contracted really reduced in size so what is the rationale of pa band pa band promotes ventricular ventricular positive interaction so you have two ventricles which now work together it allows molecular cross talk talk and activate the repair potential of the myocardium and therefore cardiomyocytes are generated in fact pa bending represents a true regenerative surgery where you start with pa bending there is increase in rv wall stress there is leftward shift of the myocardium towards the left side and that reduces the preload of the left ventricle and improves diastole and over a period of time the ventricular function improves and patient also improves and i'll show you data this is 
published, uh, I think, 2018, no, 2000, yeah, 2018, where the data has been taken from various centers out of 70 patients with dilated cardiomyopathy who were bended, 34 actually recovered. So it's not just they remained stable, they actually recovered, the left ventricle recovers. In fact, 27 of them have undergone pulmonary debanding also. So there were deaths, as you can see, one death over here, two deaths over here. However, you will see out of 34, almost 50% have recovered, which is something which is more than what you expect. So this procedure, however, one must remember that this procedure of PA banding is only possible if the right ventricular function is preserved. Because when you do PA band, you have to have a good right ventricle. So whenever we have decided to go for a PA band, we've done one. Every patient, you have to assess what is the RV function. If RV function is dysfunctional or RV function is not good, then this PA band therapy cannot be applied. Now, let us finally look at the natural history and prognosis of patients of DCM. It's highly variable. I'm sure all of you who are seeing such patients would see that some patients totally recover. However, others continue to go for heart failure and stage heart failure, and some of them die. In two, again, big studies, one being from Australia, the other being from USA, the one-year survival was about 60%. Five-year survival was about 50%, and at 10 years, the survival was about 40 to 45%, as you see over here. This is the US registry. In the Australian registry, the survival was little better at one, five, and 10 years. However, they also reported a 20-year survival, which was 56%. So overall, I would say about half of the patients or little less than half of the patients do survive. However, survival does not necessarily mean that they have completely normalized. What are the causes of deaths? Early deaths are principally caused by heart failure. However, late deaths would be sudden due to arrhythmias. So patients who are doing relatively well on medications may just drop dead because of ventricular arrhythmias, especially if their ventricular function continues to be quite bad. Embolic events, mostly because of the clot in the left ventricle, are seen in 33% of patients almost one third. So one has to keep an eye for any left ventricular clot. Highest risk usually seen early after diagnosis. It is generally said that those who have, those who have, who die, about 26% of death or transplantation in the first year after diagnosis. After that, the risk becomes quite low, one year, 1% 1 per year. We must try and do risk stratification because then we can identify children who can be treated with medical therapy. On the other hand, we should also be able to identify children who require advanced heart failure therapy, including listing for cardiac transplantation. Survival also would depend on the cause. If you can discover the etiology of DCM, then generally children with familial DCM have a better survival at 94%. Children with neuromuscular disorder like Becker's or Duchenne muscular dystrophy would have the worst survival, five year being only 57%. So this slide, which is rather old, shows you that overall survival may be about 50% at 10 years, but it is best in familial DCM and it is worst in those who have neuromuscular disorders. Other predictors include age at diagnosis. As I said, mortality is highest in the first year after diagnosis. And those who are diagnosed after the age of six years are likely to have higher risk of death or transplantation, almost three to four times than if the diagnosis made before the age of six years. However, this has not been a consistent data in many studies. So age at diagnosis may not have much meaning, but generally it is believed that those who are diagnosed later may have worse prognosis than those who are diagnosed earlier. Also, there has been survival advantage, as I showed you, with beta blockers. At least we have some data on beta blockers. And ACE inhibitors are also supposed to be helping in improvement of LV function or LV remodeling. Therefore, these two drugs must be used in all patients who have dilated cardiomyopathy. Some of the predictors of poor outcome would include initial lower fractional shortening and continued lower fractional shortening. That means failure to improve during follow-up. That's not a good sign. Ventricular arrhythmias, detection of 
at LV thrombus. High LV and diastolic pressure, more severe left ventricular dilatation at diagnosis, and also, as I showed you earlier, also white versus non-white. Non-white children in American population do much worse than white children. I don't know where the Asians would fall, but perhaps somewhere in between. And another predictor that I told you earlier is anti-pro BNP level. In fact, this is a study which is again published recently where they said that in a multivariate analysis, anti-pro BNP level was the strongest independent predictor for adverse outcome. Another study which is published from Italy, which compares the data of adults with children has given the following table for predictors of death or heart transplantation. This is the univariate analysis, but the final few columns are actually multivariate analysis and we should look at these columns. High NYHA class, that means if somebody presents at NYHA class three or four, that is a poor predictor of prognosis. There is high likelihood of death or heart transplantation. Left ventricle ejection fraction, even one unit increase of left ventricle ejection fraction is a good sign because it is actually a sign of good prognosis. Similarly, beta blockers, if you look at beta blockers, beta blockers hazard ratio is so much less than one, 0 0.082. Again, a protective drug, which helps in improvement of these patients. So these two have lo much lower hazard ratio, whereas NYHA has a very high hazard ratio. So NYHA, advanced NYHA class, is a predictor of death or heart transplantation. Increase in LV ejection fraction and beta blocker usage is against or is a predictor of good prognosis. Overall, this is uh, the same data from Italy where they've compared adults with children. What it shows is that for all prognostic indicators, children are worse than adults, whether it is death or heart transplantation, pediatric population has a much worse survival, whether it is heart failure related death or heart transplantation, again, it is much worse, or whether we talk of sudden death or major ventricular arrhythmias, again, pediatric patients do much worse than adult patients. So overall, when they compared the data of 47 pediatric with 141 adult patients, pediatric patients did worse than adult patients. So to conclude, I would summarize my talk. It is the most common type of childhood cardiomyopathy. And although we can do extensive investigations, but the etiology remains unknown in majority of instances. Patients often present with varying degrees of heart failure. However, almost 50% of them would recover. Most of them completely normalize. Echocardiography is the diagnostic tool of choice. It is not only used for making the diagnosis, but also for monitoring the response to therapy. And we all do it very, very frequently. Medical management is mostly symptomatic, that is diuretics, ACE inhibitors, vasodilators. However, long-term use of beta blockers may improve survival and therefore must be used. Newer drugs where we, are, we don't have a lot of data include secubitril valsartan combination and ivabradine, especially in those with tachycardia. Cardiac transplantation, is recommended only for oh, end-stage heart failure. And recent therapy of pulmonary artery bending is encouraging, and it focuses at reactivating cardiomyocytes proliferation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions, if any. Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful presentation. You always uh, look, uh, wait for your uh, lectures. And my question is to you that the, what is the cutoff level or the uh, point uh, above which uh, that indicates the bad prognosis in case of anti pro BNP? And uh, regarding the beta blockers, which beta blocker uh, you prefer uh, other than carvedilol? Thank you for your question. Uh, I first use carvedilol, but sometimes we are not able to use, then the other beta blocker that we use is metoprolol. Why? Because metoprolol is the one that has been used in adults and has been shown to improve survival. So that, will, that is our other choice. The only problem I face with metoprolol is that when you want to give it to small children, then dosing becomes a bit of a problem. Whereas with carvedilol, it is much easier because you do get a tablet of 6.25 milligram also. Regarding anti-pro-BNP, I think 
mostly it has been seen that if it is more than 2000 to 2500 then that is a bad prognostic sign however having said that what is important is the serial determination for example you are getting it 3000 or 3500 and over a period of time it does not show a decline i will be very worried about it however if it shows a decline to even 1500 or something that's a good sign so an absolute cutoff value may be difficult but a serial value of it not coming down with with therapy is something that should be worrying thank you ma'am i have also some questions to you uh, i am already in hotel and my <laughs> charge is now okay so my question is about sacubitral valsartan combination uh, uh, have you got any uh, experience on it? Have you ever used this uh, combination in your patient? Yes, uh, Dr. Fatima. We have, uh, in fact, uh, we our center at AIMS was part of the the multicentric trial that Dr. Shetty is doing, which is still ongoing. So we were part of it and encouraged by the response that we have used. Uh, you know, obviously, as far as his trial was concerned, it was meant only for very specific type of patients, but we started using it more often in other patients also. We don't have the systematic data analysis because the data is going to their center. However, it seems very encouraging. I must admit that we have only given to patients who have not done well on inalapril, ACE inhibitor. If they have been stable on ACE inhibitor, then I haven't changed to this combination. But if we find that despite giving them good doses of vinalapril, they're not doing well, we replace it with this combination. But yes, we've been using it. I would say I personally might have used it in about six or seven children uh, already. Thank you. And about, ma'am, we are seeing some of the cases, especially in Bangladesh, uh, uh, like they have some nutritional deficiency of the vitamin B1, carnitine, so we always add these uh, kind of uh, vitamins and carnitine in the treatment protocol uh, just to give benefit of doubt because we can't do the label. But sometime I have seen that once we give, uh, in few of my patients I have seen after giving a single dose of injection vitamin B1, uh, the patient improved dramatically. So uh, this is a kind of like very, very, so uh, uh, what is your experience about very, very related cardiomyopathy in India? I, I think I have to go back about 15, 20 years ago and we used to see what you're saying. We used to see a lot of these cardiomyopathies. They would give injection and they would just improve, you know, in no time. It's such a dramatic yes. response. But yes. fortunately, we don't see much of it now. But having said that, I think there are a few pockets in, uh, you know, some parts of India, for example, there is some data that has come up from Karnataka. You might have read it also, where the beriberi was found to be presenting as pulmonary artery hypertension, not just DCM, but pulmonary yeah. artery hypertension. And again, giving them, uh, uh, you know, injection of vitamin was greatly was of great help. So I think it is still there, and I, there is absolutely no harm in giving those drugs if you feel that they could be responsible because they are harmless drugs. Fact, carnitine, is also something, carnitine is also something that we've been using uh, almost routinely without even doing levels. Yes. So. So I think these are rather safe drugs and there's no harm in using them. Absolutely. But we don't, honestly, we don't see much of uh, beriberi now. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, I think because of the dietary habit and, uh, and education of the patient, they are not eating police rice. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, that is maybe one of the reasons. And ma'am, about another question from the student, that sometimes we see that there's myocarditis. Uh, the viral myocarditis, especially in COVID um, time, we find so many cases of myocarditis and then like MIS, uh, uh, MISC and like uh, PIMSTS. At that time, we were seeing a lot of myocarditis who, uh, and many of them led to cardiomyopathy also. So uh, what are the investigation we should do to differentiate myocarditis from other cause of cardiomyopathy? So I think... Uh... Many a times we do it or we treat them empirically. 
you know, like if somebody gives you a history of COVID or something, you would know it's likely to be MISC and you would start IVIG in that patient. So very often we do it empirically, but when we did not have COVID and, you know, we were, uh, let's say, very systematically studying these cases, then we would get an MRI done. So if you can afford, if you have the facilities for MRI, then that is the best way. Otherwise, it's endomyocardial biopsy. But endomyocardial biopsy is something that we are not very enthusiastic because it's an invasive procedure. In children, it becomes sometimes difficult to do it. About ma'am, cardiac uh, like biomarker troponin, like uh, uh, is there any use of doing like uh, troponin I and then like CKMB? I, I think uh, those drugs could be high even in cardiomyopathy. So they may give you a clue but what I would generally say, if there's a short history, you know, our indications for giving IGR, IV IGR, if you have a short history, if you have not much cardiomegaly on the X-ray, lot of PVH, we generally would take, you know, we think about myocarditis and give them IVIG. This is what we've been doing at our center. But yes, right. we've not been proving them to be myocarditis. We are just empirically thinking it to be myocarditis. Yeah. Uh, there is a question, ma'am, I think, in the chat box for yes. you. Yes, it says, do you suggest furosemide and digoxin patient with DCM routinely? I think furosemide is used for heart failure. Uh, it's not really because of DCM. It is because of the heart failure that we use furosemide. Digoxin is something that we are a bit worried about using in DCM simply because you may have more toxicity during dilated, in patients of dilated cardiomyopathy. So if there is if, if I'm using beta blockers, then I would probably refrain from using digoxin. I would give them furosemide if they're in failure. If I cannot give beta blockers because of advanced failure, then I would give digoxin very carefully. But generally, our prescription for digoxin has really gone down in the last, uh, I would say, decade or so. We hardly ever use digoxin except for, of course, tech arrhythmias. If you're suspecting some tech arrhythmia, ectopic atrial tachycardia or something, yes go ahead and use the digoxin, but I would rather go for beta blockers. Is there any question, Mofarjal, from anybody? So there is another one which says, uh, last year we had an infant of seven months history of fever, three weeks back, followed by cardiomegaly. Is there, a, is there any role of IVIG in this type of a case? You know, if you ask me, I would give this patient IV because it's a very short history. Uh, of course, you try and ask the parent if there was some cardiac symptoms before this fever. But if child was totally asymptomatic, just for three weeks, he's become symptomatic. I would probably give him IVIG. Again, IVIG is like, you know, like vitamin. It doesn't really hurt, except that it is an expensive drug. But uh, we are pretty uh, liberal about using IVIG, especially in small infant where the dose is not much of a problem. Two gram per kilogram is what you give. So if it is a six, seven kg child, then you just have to spend 12 gram worth of money. So I would give this patient IVIG. Uh, Madam, I have I asked this question. Yeah, the last year we have got one patient from Maman Singh that is age seven months, and we have not used IVIG. That patient was developed a cardiom dilated cardiac Right. Yeah. My question is we've actually published our data on IVIG long time ago, and we realized that the the, the percentage of improvement was same in the IVIG group and non-IVIG group, but the response was much faster. So IVIG patient improved faster than the non-IVIG patients, but the number of children who improved was same in both the groups. So IVIG may not be doing much of uh, you know, improvement, but it's being a relatively harmless drug. We tend to give it quite often if we suspect anybody with query myocarditis simply because we are not able to do MRI in everybody, nor are we able to do the viral biomarker. So we just empirically give it. So the question is, what is the lower limit of EF uh, in a child? Uh, yeah. 
I would say that anything less than minus. See, we usually take fifty percent as the cutoff. So if you have anything fifty percent less than fifty percent, you have to be very very suspicious. But anything less than forty five, forty percent, we have to think of LV dysfunction. Again, I'm not labeling this patient as dilated cardiomyopathy. We have to look for a reason for LV dysfunction. And if you can't find a reason, then maybe you have to think of DCM. Yes, ma'am. So I, it was, ma'am, a very uh, nice lecture. I think you have another question from Dr. Farah Choudhury. Uh, she is asking you dilated cardiomyopathy with L kappa. Okay. What are the steps of management? She is asking. So, so I would say that let's not call it dilated cardiomyopathy because L kappa is associated LV dysfunction because of MIs. So the treatment is simply surgery. You have to reverse this problem of L kappa. You have to put the left coronary artery back in aorta, and hopefully the left ventricle improves over a period of time. So I that's why I use the word curable DCM. You know, in inverted coma. So DCM is something where you can't find a cause here because you know L kappa. You have to get them operated. That is the only way you can help these children. I think there is. Is there another question? Some patients have low EF despite all the drugs, but patients are relatively better. What should be their follow-up strategy and further management? Yes, this is a quite a big group. I would entirely agree with you that there are patients whose ejection fraction is, you know, thirty percent, thirty-five. They're not too bad, but and they do very well clinically. So I would continue to give them beta blockers and enalapril or ACE inhibitor. Just no diuretic. If they're okay, then I wouldn't give them diuretic. Just ACE inhibitors and uh, beta blockers, and I will keep increasing the dose of beta blockers, which is the maximally tolerated dose. And generally, once the dose is achieved, then I would call them. If they are young, less than three four years, I would call them every six months. If they are old, I will call them yearly. And once we, I find that their ventricular function has returned to normal, I would give them drug for another year and then stop. Because recurrences are also known, so one has to be careful. That at least for one more year after ejection fractions return to normal, you should continue to see them, and continue uh, ask them to continue with the medications. But I would take away diuretics because if the patient is doing well, there is no need for a diuretic. Diuretic is totally symptomatic management. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. It was uh, very. informative and i think our student uh, 32 student they have attended all of them are post graduate student uh, for fcps and md and some of them are also pediatric cardiologists and i think they are immensely benefited from your talk because it was so much informative and you give examples of so many studies from so many registries and uh, and you asked and learning has no uh, i think we are learning uh, quite senior now but even then i learn every day and as usual i also learn two day from you and uh, it was actually very nice lecture ma'am and uh, you are such a busy person even then you have taken this lecture and um, for uh, for about one hour now and lastly i would like to congratulate you for becoming the vice chancellor mm -hmm. of bd rajesh university health mm -hmm. university I, i was not informed about that mm -hmm. but this is a very big post and i hope that uh, you will uh, enlighten your post with uh, uh, with uh like more knowledge more wisdom and as usual uh, you will continue your work so ma'am okay. i think with that we would like to um, uh, complete the finish this session from our side and now i am handing the mic to the microphone to the moderator for finishing the session thank you ma'am thank, thank you, you so much for taking this talk lecture Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pratima, for inviting me. Thank you.
مفجر السلام عليكم مدام شو انت باتشا ها كيف صار دا اوكي اوكي مدام مدام كيف من سويس ميت كورا دا بيتا شو نكا مدام Thank you, Dr. Fatima. Thank you, thank you. Ma thank you, madam, very much. It is a great honor of us that you are here for us. Thank it's you. It's a nice lecture delivery. And we have, and we have man, uh, learned a lot of things, including your study. That is thank a new one. Uh, that's of the textbook. Thank you so, so much. I hope in the long run you will your health will be well and we we are eager to more lecture from you anytime anytime my pleasure thank you thank you madam thank you thank you thank you ma'am